Okay, welcome to Galaxy Installation with Ansible. Now we'll actually get to the fun part of today where we actually get to set up and install a Galaxy server. We'll start by going through how all the playbooks work and then we'll move on to the actual installation portion where we set up Galaxy on a fresh Ubuntu server. So please note that all of the roles are regularly used on both CentOS and Ubuntu machines. So if you have different versions of these, it should in theory work. If it doesn't, it's a bug, please let us know. So I'm gonna start a little bit by talking about how the playbooks work, how they're structured, that sort of thing. We'll be using the official, official Ansible Galaxy role to do this. This role can be found in a piece of software called Ansible Galaxy, which is actually separate as galaxyproject.galaxy. The official role is very configurable. Anything you might want to change in Galaxy server, the official role can usually do it. It's widely used in a lot of different scenarios. This forms the basis of a lot of the Docker container setups, a lot of the individual private servers, and all public use galaxy.star servers are deployed through Ansible. If you're looking for a rock solid production ready way to go, this is it. So let's talk a little bit about the Ansible role. You've learned a little bit about Ansible roles in the first part of today and how they look, how they're structured. The Galaxy role is just like that, except the more complicated. So of course, we have the entry point of tasks. And in the tasks, the very first thing we'll access is the main.yaml. You don't need to be doing any of this. I'm just going to go through all of the different parts of this and how it works. There are four important variables that you'll need to keep in mind. The Galaxy root, this is where Galaxy will be set up. The Galaxy commit ID, what version of Galaxy we want to deploy. And the Galaxy config variable, this controls all of the configuration options that are set in your galaxy.yaml file. So let's go back to the task quickly. As with every role, there is an entry point, tasks main, and this will include a few key steps. Cloning Galaxy, managing configuration, fetching dependencies, managing the mutable setup, and finally managing the database. So we can see all of that reflected in the playbook. There's a little bit for privilege separation, setting up the directories and the user, managing some paths, cloning Galaxy, uh, managing existing Galaxies, static setup, dependencies, mutable setup, managed database, building the client, and error docs, which is not used so often. So the very first task is cloning Galaxy. The clone task is the one we'll be using today. There are multiple ways to set up Galaxy, but we're interested in cloning. Galaxy git will be run, this git module in Ansible, and it will fetch the whatever commit ID we want to specify from the Galaxy repo. By default, this is set to the official Galaxy project slash Galaxy repository. It will report if the version changes. So when you update your Galaxy, the version might change and things might need to happen as a result. It will set up the virtual environment and it'll also remove any compiled files. So when you update Galaxy, Python compiles the Python code into Python bytecode to make it a little bit faster to load next time. There's a task that just removes those. So any old code that's left around gets cleaned out and you can be sure that every time this playbook runs, you're getting exactly the version of Ansible or exactly the version of Galaxy that you want. The next task is managing configuration. This just sets up all of the static files. So we copy in any additional Galaxy config files. We install more config files. We install any local tools. We'll talk about that on the third day, how to deploy some tools and a bit on the second day as well. Configure dynamic job rules. Those will be on the third day. And copy out the Galaxy configuration file. This is a very important file that we'll talk about a lot. When you're deploying your Galaxy with Ansible, you sometimes have different additional files you want to configure or different additional Galaxy configuration files, like the data types configuration or the genome builds or the email block list. All of these can be set differently on each Galaxy. And there's this uh, stanza Galaxy config files, which lets you deploy arbitrary files from your Ansible setup onto the server somewhere that Galaxy can access them. Next up is the dependencies. So whenever Galaxy is finally on disk, we've got 
the git role has cloned the code, the static roles have set up all of the configuration files, then we're ready to load the dependencies. This will install all of the base Galaxy dependencies. Galaxy hosts its mirror of all of the dependencies to make it fast. Um, it'll collect any additional conditional dependencies. So if you configure Galaxy such that you are using like LDAP for authentication, this requires an additional Python module. If you're managing Galaxy by hand, this won't be installed. But if you are using it through Ansible, Galaxy knows to look for this, knows to look for all of the different configuration options that can have additional dependencies and then install those as well. One of the nice things about using the Ansible roles is that all of this knowledge and experience as administrators gets encoded into the Galaxy playbooks and then you get to use that for free. Okay, next, mutable setup. So Galaxy initializes this directory for mutable data um, and mutable configuration files. Galaxy, when it's running, manages some of the configuration files by itself. Usually you as an administrator will not need to touch these files. However, Galaxy does need access to them and to update them. Some examples of this are the tools that are installed from the Galaxy tool shed. You want these to be available and Galaxy will need to write to them. Okay, once the mutable setup is done, Galaxy is almost complete. Next up, we'll be managing the database. So Galaxy has some database management tasks where every time you run the playbook, Galaxy checks to make sure that the current version of the Galaxy database is the same as the maximum version. And if Galaxy's current version of the database is not the maximum possible, then Galaxy, the Ansible roles will run all of the migrations that are necessary to get you updated to the latest version of Galaxy. This is another common problem that administrators experience when they're not managing Galaxy through Ansible. This was something that I personally forgot a lot when I was managing usegalaxy.eu was to do the actual migrations every time and check for them. Galaxy would start up and it would crash. And when we switched to Ansible, it was so, life was so much better because we didn't have to remember this manually anymore. It was just automatic. All of these things were taken care of for us. So handlers, like every other Ansible role, there are handlers. One of the important handlers here will restart Galaxy. So whenever we make configuration changes, whenever we change how Galaxy behaves, Galaxy knows, or rather the Ansible role, knows to restart Galaxy at the, when it's done. As with other roles, a number of default values are provided. Things like should it manage users and paths. And by default, the role is very conservative. We'll set a lot of variables to override this and make sure it works how we want to. By default, it pulls from the official Galaxy project repository, that sort of thing. If you have a fork of Galaxy you want to run, you can do that as well here. So a quick summary, Galaxy is cloned or updated if it was already cloned through Git. A virtual environment is created if it doesn't exist. The dependency or the configuration files are installed. All of the galaxy.yaml, the jobs configuration, the dependencies, anything else like that. Next, any missing dependencies are installed. And lastly, the database is updated. And when all of that's done, if Galaxy needs to be restarted, it is. And next, we'll start with the actual fun part, installing Galaxy. Okay, let's get started installing Galaxy, the actual fun part about today. There are a couple of requirements you'll need before we get started. Some of these we've taken care of for you. Some of these you'll have to take care of yourself when we go through the tutorial. So the first one is that you have Ansible installed, of course. You need Ansible to run the playbooks. We've done that for all of the virtual machines we'll be using today, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, the Ansible version is a recent Ansible version. Ansible changes a lot over time, and it needs to be regularly updated. We've taking care of this as well. Number three, that you'll have an inventory file. We covered this a little bit in the Ansible tutorial, the original Ansible tutorial. <laughs> you'll need to set up an inventory file with a group of hosts called Galaxy servers. There's a step for this in the tutorial, we'll get to it. Number four, that your virtual machine has a public DNS entry. We'll do SSL certificates 
during this tutorial and having a proper working DNS entry is part of this. We've taken care of that for you as well, but if you're setting up your own server, this may be different for you, how that happens. That your VM has Python 3 installed. So all of the Ansible packages we'll be using, all of the Ansible code will run, has been updated for Python 3. Galaxy runs Python 3. There's no more Python 2. Lastly, that in your inventory file, you use the full host name that has been provided and not just localhost as you might have done in the Ansible tutorial. This is very important because we'll be using that full name that we've written there in a couple of different places in our playbook. And lastly, again, if you're using Ubuntu or Debian, CentOS, or RHEL, none of this should matter. It should work identically for all of the different scenarios. So let's get started. First thing we need to do is prepare all of our requirements. We've collected all of the different roles we'll want to use today in a text box that you can copy. And the steps say, create a new directory, Galaxy, in your home folder. So I'm going to create a new directory, Galaxy, and change into that. It's an empty directory. And now I'm going to set up the requirements.yaml file. Requirements.yaml. And here I will paste in all of our different requirements. I've just copied these directly out of the training materials here. And I'll save that. So you can see we have the requirements file and it has all of that content. You might be wondering what each of these different roles do. These are the different roles that will be used throughout the tutorial. So the first role sets up the Galaxy project, Galaxy server. The second role we'll be using installs Nginx, the web server. The third, Postgres the database engine that we'll be using today. Additionally, we have a role, NateFood.PostgreSQLObjects, from one of the Galaxy developers, Nate Kororor. We'll have the pip role from Gearling Guy to set up Python's pip command to install some dependencies when we need to do that later. The miniconda role will set up the conda dependency system, which Galaxy uses to manage tools optionally. <laughs> Additionally, we have Galaxy systemd, this will help us set up systemd roles in order to manage Galaxy. And lastly, certbot. This will request SSL certificate. Certbot wraps the certbot command from Let's Encrypt. So with that, we have our requirements.yaml file that we've written. We're going to use this Ansible Galaxy install command to install everything from the requirements YAML into the roles directory. As you can see, all of these roles are getting downloaded from GitHub and installed onto our roles directory. So you'll see them here in roles. Excellent, everything's working so far. <laughs> Next up, we'll need to set up an ansible.cfg. This is an ansible configuration file. We'll just create that in the same directory as our requirements.yaml. And this tells ansible that we want to use Python 3 as the interpreter. Ansible can still use Python 2 or Python 3, that we have an inventory file, which will be called hosts, and that we don't want to enable retry files. These can be a bit annoying and not very useful for our case. So next up, we'll need to create the host file. Your host name is definitely different than this one. We're going to write this into the hosts file. So here, next to our ansible.cfg, the requirements.yaml, we're going to create the host file. And inside there, we're going to paste some content. But this name is correct. We can run the hostname command, hostname minus F, to find out what our hostname is. And when we're ready, we can paste that back into the host file. <laughs> so when you're done, your host file should have a group, Galaxy service. So this in your host, this defines the group name. Our group name is Galaxy Servers for all of these servers. We're going to say our host name. It needs to be your own one. It cannot be one that's different from your machine. That we have the Ansible connection equals local. So Ansible has a couple of different ways of connecting to remote machines. <laughs> it can connect through SSH or it can connect directly and just run the commands on the same machine. We are, we're going to use local here. We could use SSH equally as well. However, it adds some extra overhead that we don't need. We can just tell Ansible, hey, we're running the commands on this machine, just run them directly. 
And lastly, Ansible user. Ansible's changed over time how it behaves with respect to this variable. And in some cases, it can implicitly determine who which user it is running as. But we're going to set it explicitly just to be safe. So I'm going to save this file and just review what we've done. We've got our ansible.cfg. This will tell Ansible how to behave. We have our hosts file, with, which lists our Galaxy server's host, the host name, and the Ansible connection. <laughs> if you run the command hostname minus f, these two should match. And if they don't, you have an issue, and you should correct the host file to be whatever hostname minus f says. We've got our requirements file and all of our roles. So let's go back to the training quickly. OK, let's talk now about the Galactic database. So Galaxy uses a database for storage of a lot of the different data that's stored within Galaxy. Objects like users, histories, information about data sets, workflows, all of this information is stored in the database. However, there is some data that isn't stored in the database. Uh, user data sets and any reference data. All of these are stored outside the Galaxy database. When you do a back, when you do backups, you'll want to back up both your Galaxy database itself and also the separate pools of user data and any other reference data that you might have installed. So by default, Galaxy uses a library called SQL Alchemy for talking to different, da different databases. It can interface with a lot of different databases, namely SQLite, MySQL, Postgres. And by default, Galaxy uses SQLite. But for production, we don't want that. For production, we want Postgres. There are three different options. MySQL is supported, but we really strongly recommend against it. It's supported by SQL Alchemy. It may not be supported by Galaxy. So use Postgres whenever possible. Regarding database sizing, Galaxy never deletes anything from the database. Whenever items are deleted, users, histories, et cetera, they just get marked as deleted within the database, but the row does not get removed. As a result, the database will grow forever. You should allocate about around 20 gigabytes of disk space to start with. But if expanding is difficult, then start with 50. Um, it doesn't require so much memory. The resource usage of the database is not so intensive. But we also recommend running it on a separate machine just for resource isolation. So if your Galaxy server goes down, it doesn't affect, it doesn't corrupt any of the data in the database or anything like this. So the configuration looks like this. There are a couple of different formats for how you connect to the database, the database URL. There is a different format if you're connecting to a local Postgres or Postgres on a different machine. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the training. So um, whenever you have a brand new database, on first startup, Galaxy will create a schema within that database. But when you're upgrading Galaxy, on the other hand, the changes are expressed as migrations. So whenever you upgrade from Galaxy 2009 to 2105, something like this, Galaxy has some migrations that will be run that will upgrade the database and make any changes to the schema that are required. You can upgrade as well as downgrade. There are commands for this. But most of this in, in the general case is handled for you by the Ansible roles. And you won't have to worry about this. Tuning is an important consideration. So when you have a production Galaxy, you probably want to set a couple of these options. We've shown some default values, as well as the values set by usegalaxy.org and other usegalaxy.star servers. So databases, by default, have a limited number of connection slots, a limited number of clients that connect at once. Galaxy can connect a lot of times for each different query that it needs to run. One of the options for improving the performance here is to have a pool of open connections so you don't have to renegotiate the connection every time. Galaxy can take one of the active connections from the pool, run the query, return, and return the connection to the pool. Additionally, there's an option for server-side cursors. These are useful for when your Galaxy gets quite large, when there are large queries that it needs to iterate through. Server-side cursors can significantly help the performance there. So when you have slow queries or slow routes in Galaxy, one of the ways you can begin to, begin to debug this is by setting the slow query log threshold. This is used to print 
out the query that was run if the query takes too long. So when you're debugging Galaxy, when you're working with developers, having this information on hand could be helpful to figure out what's going on there. Additionally, another optimization that can be made is to track tool shed saw tools in a separate database. This is a, an optimization that can enable a couple of nice scenarios. If you are doing things like bootstrapping a fresh Galaxy with pre-built tools, pre-built instance, um, this can let you reshare all of the tools that you have installed amongst multiple galaxies, something like that. And you can also equal, do some other nice things around that. UseGalaxy.org uses this. I'm not aware of other galaxies that use this though. The database can be accessed through Galaxy through Python code using all of the models that are available to Galaxy. So Galaxy has all of these different models that describe how the table looks, what columns are there, how to do operations like resetting a password, that sort of thing. And when you want to talk to the database, one of the ways you can do that is accessing it through the Galaxy model. This isn't something you'll have to do very often, but it's good to know about. There are many other useful database queries you can run. We'll talk about this at a later point. Thank you. So next, we'll be setting up PostgreSQL. Uh, again, Galaxy supports a wide variety of different databases, but it's best tested in production under Postgres, and we recommend using this. Postgres maintains its own users and authentication system, and we'll come to that in a little bit. So we're going to set up some group variables. You might have remembered this from the Ansible tutorial that we can sign variables in Ansible to an entire group of machines or just to an individual machine. We've got a group named Galaxy Servers. So we're going to set up some group variables for that. We're going to create a directory called group bars. And within the group bars directory, we're going to create the file galaxyservers.yaml. And this String here, Galaxy Servers, needs to match exactly with this here. Otherwise, Ansible won't be able to connect the variables from the group variables file with the correct group. I'm going to paste in all of the content from the training materials. This will do a couple of different things. We'll set up the pip and Python virtual environments just to say, we want to be Python 3, Python 3, Python 3 everywhere. Not all of the Ansible ecosystem has yet migrated to being Python 3 as default. So sometimes we have to explicitly inform it that everything we're doing is Python 3 compatible. And additionally, we'll set up some PostgreSQL object users and databases. So we're going to set up a Galaxy user, and then we're going to create a Galaxy database owned by the Galaxy user that we just created. The NAFU PostgreSQL objects role will be responsible for those variables and executing them. And next, we actually need to create our Galaxy playbook. This will be the playbook that will do everything for today. So we're going to create a galaxy.yaml file. It's going to install Python 3 Postgres, sorry, Psycho PG2. Psycho PG2 is a Python library which talks to the Postgres database. We'll have the role that we want to run, the PostgreSQL role to install Postgres. And then we'll have the name foo PostgreSQL objects role which will take care of setting up the users and the groups and the databases. So we're going to open the file galaxy.yaml. This should be at the same level as your host file, your Ansible CFG, your requirements. And I'm going to paste in all of that content again. So we'll see hosts, galaxy servers. This will apply to any host listed under the group galaxy servers in your host file. We're going to become true. We're going to become root, the admin user. And then we're going to do some pre-tasks before we get started on all of the actual roles. For, and for that pre-task, we're going to install Python 3 Psycho PG2. Then we move on to the meat of the playbook. We'll run this role, Galaxy Project PostgreSQL, that will install the database. And we'll run this one to set up the actual users and groups and databases. Note that here we become true and we become the Postgres user. By default in Postgres, the only user that can connect to the database from the start is the actual Postgres user itself. So that's why we'll become that user in order to talk to the Postgres. So at this point, we're almost done, we're almost ready to run it. But let's just look at what all we've done. Your directories should look approximately like, 
approximately like this as well. You should have an Ansible, that's CFG, a galaxy.yaml. You should have some group variables file folder with galaxy servers.yaml. You should have a host file, a requirements file, and all of these roles downloaded. You should say 10 directories, five files. And with that, you're almost ready to go. I'm going to check one last thing. I've got my hosts file, which has this galaxy servers. I'm just going to check that it looks the same in my playbook and in my group bars folder. So here we see galaxy servers, galaxy servers, galaxy servers. These all need to match if things are to work correctly. And if that all looks good for you, then you're ready to run the playbook. So let's copy that Ansible playbook galaxy.yaml. And this will take a second to run. As we add more tasks, it'll get slower. But this will do everything we need to do to set up a Galaxy server. By the end of the day, we'll have this one playbook file that has absolutely everything we need. OK, that looks good. We have OK for 17. 17 tasks were fine, and seven things changed. And with this, we should have a Postgres database running. We can check that with systemctl status Postgres QL. And we'll see, OK, active, green, perfect. We can't connect to it currently because we don't have permissions. But if we run this command as the Postgres user, we can see, oh, look, here are all of the databases. So I've run psql minus l as the Postgres user. And what this does is it lists all of the databases that are currently known to Postgres. And here you can see the Galaxy database that we created owned by the Galaxy user. So perfect. Everything looks absolutely good right now. If you have any of these errors, be sure to check the documentation for what possibly went wrong there. And we run this command, and it looks good. We get our Galaxy Galaxy. If you'd like, you can connect the database itself. And here we can see a couple of different things. So there are no tables. There are some roles. I don't use these commands very often because you don't usually need them. You set them in your Ansible playbook in your group variables, and then you forget about them because you know it's going to execute the right thing. You have a lot of faith in these. And when you're done, you can do slash Q to exit, and you'll be back as the Ubuntu user. OK, awesome, fantastic. If you look in the Postgres directory, the configuration directory for Postgres with this command, you'll see a couple of different configuration files. There is the control file, the HBA. HBA stands for host-based access, I believe. This controls who can authenticate to Postgres and how. If you need to set up a network to Postgres, this will be important. But for us, it's not, because we're connecting to the Postgres on the same server. And there's also some other configuration. And you'll see this strange looking file with this extension. We already have a PGHBA, but there's the second one. So what happens is, in Ansible, there is the ability to set a property called backup. And when you backup the configuration files, it creates this duplicate file that has all of the previous contents. And every time a change is made, it backs up the file before making the changes. So if you need to revert to a previous version of the configuration, you can do that. You can see if someone's run the playbook, you can see what's changed through comparing these files. So with that, we're ready to start on Galaxy. OK, great. Let's get Galaxy installed now. So now we've got all of our database set up, all of the Postgres set up with the user and everything we need to do with Postgres. So we'll continue with getting Galaxy running and configuring Galaxy, how it works, everything. So we'll be using something called USG Mules today to set up Galaxy. There are a couple of different options for doing it. Mules are not the only option. However, they are the one that's easiest to get started with. And unless you have very strange production needs, then they're probably the one you should be using. So best practice admins don't run Galaxy with root access. They run it as a separate user. And we'll also configure that right now. 
So all of the best practices that we do, all the security best practices are available through this playbook. So we need to open our galaxy.yaml configuration file, and we're going to make a whole bunch of changes. First up, we're going to add some new roles. We need to install some more dependencies, not just the PsychoPG dependency. So I'm going to open up my galaxy.yaml. And I'm going to replace this line with this line. And instead of just the PsychoPG2 role, it'll also install ACL, which is used for access control and is need for, needed for some of the playbooks to run successfully. We also need bzip2, the compression algorithm, git to a clone galaxy, make to compile some things, tar to extract some archives, and virtual environment in order to set up the virtual environments that Galaxy will need. And we're going to add some new roles too. We're going to add the pip role, set up pip. We're going to add the Galaxy role itself, the one that does all of the fun stuff. And then we're going to add the miniconda role, which will set up miniconda. We should also become user Galaxy for this. So role, you cheat a miniconda, become true, become user Galaxy. OK. So that's the first part. We've set up some dependencies that we'll need, and we've set up the roles. But we haven't configured these roles right now, so they're running with all of their defaults. And as we mentioned earlier, the Galaxy project.galaxy role is very conservative in what it will and will, will not do by default. So we're going to instead set up some variables, specifically Galaxy create user. This is going to tell Galaxy we want you to create the user and manage it. If we change the username, if we change the shell, anything like this, Galaxy, the Ansible role will take care of it. Then we want to separate privileges. This is a very important role or important variable. This tells Gal the Ansible Galaxy role that it should have a different user managing the code base as running it. So if the user that's running Galaxy, somehow there's some remote code execution or something, that prevents your Galaxy configuration from being affected. So it makes it a little bit harder for any attacker to gain privileges. So we'll do this by default. It's a very good idea. Galaxy manage paths. We want to set this to true. This tells Galaxy, the Ansible Galaxy role, that it should set up all the directories we need, set permissions, everything like that. We'll set our Galaxy layout to root dir. This will create a single root directory, um, in this case, serve slash Galaxy. And inside that root directory will be all of the Galaxy files that we need all of the configuration, the code, the mutable configuration, et cetera. And we'll control the location of that with this galaxy root variable. Here we'll set this to serve galaxy. And everything will be under that folder, which makes it really easy to find whenever you want to see what's going on. We're going to define a galaxy user. Here it'll be named galaxy, and it'll have bash as the shell. We'll be setting up the latest version of Galaxy. We'll set our commit ID to release 20.09. And you'll notice that the variable is called commit ID, but we're pointing it to a branch. And what that means is that when we run the playbook again, if there are any changes to that branch, if there are any uh, back ports or bug fixes that are made to the 20.09 release branch, just by running the playbook again, we'll get those installed for us for free. We have Galaxy config style. We want YAML. So Galaxy previously used an INI format, and now we can use a much nicer YAML format. Next, we'll do a force checkout true. This is an option I like to use in the past because coworkers can sometimes, if you're working on this Galaxy server with multiple people, sometimes people will make a change. And they won't write it down, what they've done, something like that. Or they'll make an unexpected change that you didn't want. And so by setting Galaxy Force checkout true, if any changes have been made to the code, they'll get reverted. Everything will be back to exactly what you say in your playbook, exactly the branch, any of the changes there, and nothing else. So this is a very nice option for that purpose, just to make sure that no one affects how your Galaxy is running if you have coworkers who are working with you on this. We'll set the miniconda prefix. So Galaxy has a tool dependency directory. So Galaxy manages its own dependencies for all of the tools for us. And all of those dependencies are in the Galaxy tool dependency dir. And we're going to set up conda within that directory. Normally, Galaxy will install conda for you. 
and you don't have to worry about it. But in past versions of running this tutorial, we've discovered that because we set up Galaxy with multiple processes, sometimes those processes can conflict. And one of them will start installing Conda, and another will too, and they'll conflict, and it'll be bad. So what we do is we explicitly install Conda to solve that issue completely. We're going to install a very recent Conda, 4.7.12. And we're going to tell it that it doesn't need to manage its own dependencies. We've already got that covered. So we updated this tutorial very recently. It should work with the latest version of Galaxy. If you read this tutorial or want to do this at home at a later point, there may have been a new Galaxy release by then. You can do it with that newer version of Galaxy. It should work as well. So we're going to make some changes to group VARs, Galaxy servers. I'm going to copy and paste all of these variables in. So I'm going to edit my group variables, galaxy servers. And then I'm going to paste that in. And we have to remove all of these little pluses from the start. And so it should look like this. We've got all of our previous Python 3 and Postgres commands. And now we have galaxy configured in here. We create a separate user for Galaxy. We separate privileges. We have it manage all of this data. We set up our Galaxy user and which branch we want to run, all of this. Looks good. I think we're about ready to go. So in the group variables file, we also need to set up the Galaxy configuration. So all of the configuration that is in galaxy.yaml or in the older galaxy.ini, all of this is stored under this Galaxy config key. And under here, we have Galaxy and then some variables we can set. So now we're going to set up an admin user for the server. We're going to configure the brand. We're going to set the database connection where we want to store data. Check migrate tools. This is just for new, for older installations of Galaxy. And we're also going to set the tool data path. So let's do that now. We're going to copy this in. Down here at the bottom, I'm going to set up all of my Galaxy config. Set a brand. You can set it to whatever you like. If you like to set it, name it after yourself or so. We're going to set up a list of admin users. So these will be whenever this account is registered with Galaxy, they'll immediately be recognized as an administrator. We're just going to use it admin at example.org. For our database connection, we're going to connect to the PostgreSQL database. And this connection string looks a little bit different than networked Postgres. Instead, we're going to connect to var run PostgreSQL, which is the Postgres socket. When Postgres runs, it has a socket open on your current machine. And that is how the PSQL command works. It talks to that socket in order to talk to Postgres. And we'll be connecting to the database named Galaxy. We're going to set our file path to slash data. So all of the files that are created by Galaxy users will appear in this slash data directory. We'll discuss some options for that on another day. But the important thing to note is when you're backing up Galaxy, this is a very important day for the, this is a very important directory to back up. Additionally, the check migrate tools and the tool data path. We just need to set these to have everything work like we want. So there's some note about data storage. Um, you currently only can set one pool of data. This will hopefully be different in the future. Here's some different examples of the Postgres connection string, like we discussed. If you want to connect to a network, something on a different host or a different port, this is how you write the string. But for us today, we're connecting on localhost just to the socket. Oh, yes, variable templating. We haven't seen that before. So in our group variables, Galaxy servers, we see a couple of these braces, these braces with a variable name inside. And we have Galaxy tool dependency directory. And down here at the bottom, if you can see it, Galaxy mutable data directory. And we haven't actually defined these, you'll note. If you look for Galaxy mutable data directory, you won't find it here. So what's happening there is we're setting a variable to this template string. And whenever Ansible gets to the point where it needs this value, it'll calculate these. And I'll say, does this variable exist? Has it been created since then? And the Galaxy role itself will create a lot of these variables for us. It defines all of these data directories, this tool dependency directory. So we can just use that variable as if it exists. 
knowing that the Galaxy role will construct that for us. It'll take the Galaxy root directory and it'll construct all of the different path pieces up to the tool dependency directory, the mutable data directory, et cetera. It's a very nice feature of Ansible that makes it very easy to use. And we also need to set a bit of USG configuration. So this configuration, again, goes into group bars, Galaxy servers. Down here in your Galaxy config, we're going to paste that in. I'm going to delete all the pluses, very important. And you'll notice the whiskey key is also under the Galaxy config. So under Galaxy config, there are two keys. There's the Galaxy and the USG. And these, this will control Galaxy, while this will control how USG works. We're going to start by having it listen on any interface it can find on port 8080. So we'll be able to access that port and access Galaxy. We're going to start one process with four threads. We need to do some static mapping. This will map this route to this folder. This is something we need to do at the start with USG because we don't have, because it is our web server. It's serving with the HTTP protocol. It's serving all of Galaxy and all of the files that are needed. We also want to set the virtual environment. So when USG starts, it will load up all of the Python dependencies that we need. We need to specify the Python path so it knows where to load the Galaxy code base. And down here at the bottom, we have mules and farm. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but the key point is you can set up different worker threads and each of these will be a different process and will handle tasks that Galaxy needs to handle. And we have also declared something called a farm and we've declared a job handler farm. So if we send things to the job handler farm, it'll be randomly distributed amongst mule number one and mule number two. Sorry to save that. How many mules is a question? Start with two and add more. There's a lot of good information in some of these info boxes. So if you're interested and curious in how all of this works, give those a look in the training materials. And with that, we should be ready to go. So let's look at our group variables, Galaxy servers again, just to be sure. So we've got Galaxy, we've got all these variables to control the role and how Galaxy gets set up. We've got our Galaxy configuration. This has the configuration that'll be passed directly to Galaxy and control things like how the interface looks or the administrative users or where the data is stored. And then we have the USG configuration that controls how the USG server will be handling Galaxy, what it'll be serving, where it'll be serving it, and so on. With that, I think we're ready to run our playbook. And we can watch this go. Okay, it's starting up all of the Galaxy tasks, setting facts, creating the directories, creating the additional directories that are needed. Now it's updating Galaxy to the specified reference. So it's cloning the Galaxy repository and checking out the branch that we requested, in our case, 20.09. Some of these steps can be a bit slow the first time. They'll get faster in the future. So Galaxy version changed from nothing to some string. As we mentioned before, the role tracks what version it was previously checked out and what version is checked out now. And by doing this, it knows if it needs to upgrade the client or rebuild the interface all of these sort of different tasks that it has to do.
Again, the dependency step is a slow one. It has to fetch all of the different Python modules that Galaxy needs. Once that's done, it'll be much faster the next time. Because it'll know, hey, all of these are installed. I don't have to do anything. And as you've noticed, I've just added on to the roles at the end of the playbook. We just added the Galaxy role and the Miniconda role. And we didn't comment out any of the other roles. We just left everything that we were doing before, setting up the database and setting up um, any other dependencies that we needed. This is just a prefer personal preference of mine. I personally prefer to run the entire playbook every time. I worry a lot that if I don't run the entire playbook, maybe I've missed some change. Or maybe one of the changes in one of my roles affects one of the other roles, something like this. And by running the entire playbook every time, I can be fairly certain that everything is exactly how I specified it. And this just comes from me having come from the puppet world rather than the Ansible or Chef world and having this different preference. But you're free to do, of course, however you want to. I know a lot of our Galaxy contributors add tasks. You can annotate, um, I don't know what called tasks, limits there. You can annotate, you can give each um, task a label and then select just some of those to run. And of course, it'll run just those tasks and it'll run much faster. But I'm human, right? I'm failable. I don't ever trust that. I won't forget that, oh yeah, this one change might affect some other things. So I just run the entire playbook every time. Okay, it's checking out the database versions. It's installing Node.js. So Galaxy's client is built out of JavaScript and it needs to be compiled every time the client changes. And this task is quite slow but it's only run if the client, if Galaxy changes. So you can set Galaxy to a specific release and it won't change very often, or you can set it to a single commit, single commit ID. And then this will never need to be rebuilt. You've already built it once, but you lose out on the automatic updates. So yeah, Node is used to build the client which is now based on Vue.js. If you're interested in developer side of Galaxy, not so much of this is covered during this admin training, but there will be other events specifically for that purpose. Just come discuss with us. Normally, this is a nice time to chat with students and figure out if anything's going wrong or if everyone's doing things successfully, but teaching on video is very different. We can look through the playbook or the tutorial a little bit to see what's been written here. So free knowledge is one of the key points of these playbooks. A significant portion of the community uses these playbooks, and by using them, you get all of our configuration knowledge just for free, which is incredible. Um, all of these years of person hours going into managing Galaxy and figuring out what the best practices are, all of these, all of the knowledge from usegalaxy.org and .eu and .org.au, all of these big Galaxy servers that serve tens of thousands of users all of our knowledge has been encoded in the playbook. Whenever we say, oh, we need to also be doing this task, or it would be useful if we did this, just so we don't forget, we encode that in the playbook, and then everyone gets it for free. Here's a big comment on slow deployment. Deployment. This is just due to JavaScript being compiled. Um, database migrations can also be slow sometimes. That's something you'll need to be aware of. 
used to be that on the first Galaxy deployment that we had to make every single migration from the start. Fortunately, that's been fixed. And now the very first Galaxy deployment, when it's an empty database, it says, oh, it's empty. I'll just do the final, final schema that I know I need. I don't need to calculate the entire schema migration by migration. I can just skip to the end, as it were. But when you have an existing database, you have to go migration by migration to make sure all the data is updated and moved around appropriately. And when this is done, all of our server code will be in serve galaxy slash server will host the galaxy code base. Config folder will hold all of our configuration like galaxy.yaml. And we'll look at the permissions of this because they'll be different, right? We've set up this uh, privilege separation in order to ensure that the user running galaxy and the users managing galaxy are separate. And also a virtual environment in VM. Okay, looks like it's continuing finally. Now it'll install Miniconda and that succeeded. Okay, this looks good. Everything's okay or changed or skipped. And we've changed 21 things, 79 things were okay already. They were perfectly fine, didn't need to be changed. And now here we see a message about the restarter not implemented. So Galaxy says, hey, I, I think I'm supposed to restart, but you haven't told me how to. You haven't told me how I managed and how I should be restarted. So it's going to not know how to do this. We'll set this up later. And with that, we're ready to start exploring our Galaxy server. So if we run the tree command again, we can see all of these directories have been created for us. And if we look at the permissions on these directories, you'll see that a lot of them are owned by root. The configuration directory is owned by root the local tools, the server code. So if anyone gets into our Galaxy server, they still can't actually change anything about the code base. They can't make things worse. There's a variable data directory and a jobs directory. If we look in serve Galaxy um, server, this looks like our normal Galaxy server code base. We can see all of the manage DB, run.sh, things that we normally expect. And in serve galaxy config, we'll see the configuration files that have been created for us. Right now, this is just the galaxy.yaml file. If we look in that file, we'll see a lot of variables actually. First, we see this nice note reminding us not to make any changes because they'll be overwritten. And then we see all of the USB configuration. Down below is all of our Galaxy configuration. But look, there are a ton of different variables that we didn't set, right? We only set admin users, brand, file path, a couple of other things. But the Ansible role is taking care of setting all of these other variables that are useful or interesting for us to set to make sure the Galaxy gets configured how we want it to. So for a lot of the directories where Galaxy needs to make a cache or do some work, all of these are set to be in our Galaxy var directory for all of our variable data. Additionally, things like temp paths are set, the job working directory is set to serve Galaxy jobs, so Galaxy will write the job files there. You see our tool data, all of these sorts of different things. So Galaxy, the Ansible role takes care of all of this for us, so we didn't have to worry about it. If you were configuring this Galaxy by hand, you of course would have to remember that all of these things might be accessed or might be set and that we need to point them in the correct locations. Just another one of those times where Ansible does a lot of work for us. So we've looked at that. And now we're going to do this optional task, launching USB by hand. So I'm going to become the Galaxy user. And now I'm the Galaxy user. And I'm going to go into serve Galaxy server. This is where all of the Galaxy code is contained. I'm going to activate the virtual environment. 
this will load all the different Python modules that Galaxy needs, all the dependencies. And then I'm going to start Galaxy with USGI. So very simple. USGI listens, USGI does a bunch of checks. And now the Galaxy code starts up. Migrations are run, creating the new database from scratch. It didn't need to. And now all the way down here, Galaxy server instance it starts up and it's running. So now our Galaxy should be listening on port 8080. Up here in the whiskey configuration we saw, we listened through the HTTP protocol to any interface and port 8080. So I'm going to open my browser, gat 0.eu.training.galaxyproject.eu uh, 8080. And that, if everything worked, you should see your Galaxy server. And of course, again, this will be a different address for you than it is for me. It's the address of your server, which can be found in the hostname command again, or in the spreadsheet. So we've set it up. We've got Galaxy running by hand. This is looking good. We see our tools. We see the brand that we set, customized however we wanted it. Everything looks good. This is the really. We're doing everything by hand, and this is obviously not optimal. We want Galaxy to start automatically and to restart if it crashes. So we'll use systemd for that purpose. OK, let's talk a little bit about controlling Galaxy with systemd or supervisor. So I'm going to talk mainly about the systemd aspect. And if you would like to know more about the supervisor portion, please come back and check this at your own convenience. So we're using systemd. It's the current Linux in its system. It's used by all of the popular distributions. If you know how to manage systemd, then it'll be good for you no matter what distribution you're using. It's used to bootstrap all of the user space programs which are running after the system boots. It can manage processes, it can manage children of those processes, and it can restart processes when they crash. So systemd replaces a lot of the existing init systems. Um, all of these had various forms of service definitions. The systemd one is a lot cleaner and easier to understand than any of the previous incarnations. So the systemd layout has two main folders. There's the lib systemd system folder, which has all of the package provided uh, definitions. So like when you install nginx, there is an nginx service unit that comes with nginx, and this gets installed into lib. Additionally, there's the etsa systemd system directory. And these, this holds all of the user-defined services. So whenever you want to manage your own service or want to write a custom init system or init file to manage a service, all of those go in Etsa. And that's where Galaxies will be as well. So this is what a systemd Galaxy service unit looks like. We're using Galaxy as the example here. It starts off with an overview of the unit saying, okay, here is the description. It has some name. It needs to start after the network service and also after the time sync service. And then we get into the service description, which says actually how this piece of software will run. Here we set a UMask, the default permissions that are set for the service. It's a simple service. There are a couple of different types of services. Simple just means it starts and runs forever in the foreground. It runs under the user galaxy and the group galaxy. It has working directory of serve galaxy server. So whenever the process starts, the process will start from that working directory. It has a 10 second start timeout. If the service doesn't start responding within 10 seconds or it crashes before then, then systemd will know to either restart the service or do something else. There is an exec start command that says, okay, please run this command. You'll need to specify the full paths to everything in that command. We also set some custom environment variables like the Galaxy home directory and where the Galaxy virtual environment is. We additionally set a memory limit this is one of the really nice things that systemd can do since it integrates with C groups quite heavily. Systemd can say, oh, this service should never have more than this amount of CPU time, this amount of disk time, and this amount of memory. It's really a wonderful feature of systemd. And whenever those processes meet those limits, systemd will kill them and potentially restart them. I say potentially because we've set here the restart policy to always, but there are, there are alternative restart policies. Additionally, we enable memory, CPU, and block IO accounting. So what these do is they just say, please keep track of how much memory, CPU, and block 
or disk usage that this system D unit uses in all of its children. And that enables you to set the limits later. And lastly, it says install wanted by multi-user target. So this says under a multi-user system, this is wanted by the multi-user environment. You don't need to worry about that one too much. All of the system D uh, services are accessed by the system CTL command. This gives you the ability to see the status, start, stop, and restart services, as well as enable or disable services. These just say, should the service start at boot or not? System CTL also improves upon previous commands. The previous Ubuntu command would only let you check the status of one service unit at a time, but system CTL enables you to run these commands across many services if you want. So you can see the system CTL status of Galaxy and Nginx and Slurm and other things all at once if you want, which is really a nice convenience. Speaking of status, this is what the status output looks like. We can see the name of the unit. We can see that it's been loaded, uh, that it's been active since some time active is running and good and happy. There is a main PID, a main process ID. If you need to track that down on the system, you can see how many tasks it's running, how many different threads it's running. Um, memory and CPU as well. You can see how much CPU time it's used and how much memory. Again, all of this can be set to allow you to set thresholds that when that service reaches those thresholds, it will be killed which is good for preventing individual services from taking over your system. You don't want the Galaxy service to consume all of the memory on the system and then uh, slow it down. And you can also see the C group here. So the C group lists the main process as well as all of its children. Previous init systems didn't use C groups and thus couldn't track all of the children of processes. So once a main parent ID launched some children, it would lose track of all of that. And C groups enables us to do accounting, not just on the main process ID, but also on all of its children, which makes it a huge improvement. So that's it for the system D slides. And if you want to know more about supervisor, you can read that here as well. Thank you. So system D is a process manager. All of the major operating systems have since switched to system D. Originally, they used a bunch of different ones, but now we've mostly all standardized on system D. <laughs> to set this up, we'll need to add a role to our playbook. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go back to my terminal. I'm currently logged in as the Galaxy user, and I need to log back out and just type the exit command for that. So I'm back to the Ubuntu user in the Galaxy directory with my playbooks and everything. And now we're going to add a new role. Use Galaxy U that Galaxy System D. And this is a role that will configure the System D unit files, as they're called, which control startup of Galaxy. We also need to set a couple of uh, variables for this. So we're going to go back into our group bars and we're going to set up some variables that control how System D works. And delete the pluses again. It should look nice and pretty and colorful. Um, so we've got the system D section. We're going to be using Galaxy System D mode mule. We talked about the USB mules before, and we just want to tell system D that we're going to be using mules. The system D role knows a couple of different ways of serving Galaxy. We're going to set this variable as the listen address, and then we're going to set the handler name. So remember when we set up Galaxy, we ran the playbook the first time, it said, hey, I don't know how to restart Galaxy. This is where we tell it, here's how I restart Galaxy. We also need to define the handler that will actually invoke that. We've told Galaxy's, um, the Ansible Galaxy role that the handler you should call is restart Galaxy, is restart Galaxy. So now we need to define that handler. And we're going to paste that in. So in most roles, this restarting is done automatically. In the Galaxy role, this isn't because of how Galaxy has so many different ways to deploy it. You can deploy it with uh, mules. You can deploy it with zerglings and zergs. And each of these has different, very specific things about how they're restarted. And additionally, on top of that, the administrator of the Galaxy may have different preferences. 
like they may say, oh, I don't want you to restart automatically because I want to do it by hand or I want to do it part by part or something like this. So we give the administrators full control over restarting Galaxy. And yes, yeah, so we've defined a handler here. The handlers are called at the very end of the playbook. Once all the tasks have run, all the handlers are invoked. And here's one that just says it's called restart Galaxy, which was the same name we told the role that we were going to call it. It's going to run the system D task. And it's going to say the service named Galaxy it should be restarted. And handlers are not always invoked. They're only invoked when they're notified. So when Galaxy is updated, something like this, or the dependencies change, or the configuration changes, then we notify the handler and say, hey, you need to activate and do whatever you do. In this case, restart Galaxy. And with that, we're ready to go. So it's again running through all of the configuration, all of the steps, just to make sure it's exactly like we want it to be. And then when it gets finally to the end, the only thing that should change this time is setting up the, uh, the system D units. There we go. These three things changed. That we deploy the unit, we enable it. So it started at boot time. And then lastly, that it needs to start. So if we do systemctl status galaxy, we should see our galaxy service. And it should say active running. We can see that it's loaded from this file. It says systemd system galaxy.service. We'll go look at that file in a second. It's enabled. So on boot, this will automatically be invoked. It has a main process. US key, and then it has a bunch of child processes that are also running. It has um, some tasks that are running and a limit, memory, and a limit. This is one of the nice things about systemd is that it's highly integrated with C groups. So you can tell your systemd units, hey, please don't use more than this much memory. Please don't use more memory than I have, or save me four gigabytes or something like this to make sure that even if Galaxy is misbehaving, as people are using it really, really heavily, that the entire server doesn't become unresponsive, especially if you're running other services on the same server. So we can see all of this. It looks fine. The service is running. If you see something else, you should check for that. So. Let's check that our Galaxy is still loaded again before we'd run the US key by hand. OK, we can refresh, and it works. And that means it's now running through system team. There is the command journal CTL. We can follow a unit called Galaxy. And this will show us all of the log files from Galaxy. So I can open up the log files here and see every time I refresh the page, new logs show up which is exactly what we want to see. So we can see all of the logs from Galaxy in one place, which is very convenient. I'm going to close out of that with Control-C. OK, this is looking good. Next, we're going to serve it with a proper web server. All right, let's talk about gearing towards production. So what is a production Galaxy server? This is a server that is ready to be used by many, many people. It's designed to be resilient, designed to be easy to scale, and it's designed to be easy to manage. When we say resilient, we mean a server that if something goes wrong, if some user is using too many resources, the entire server won't be taken offline or compromised. All of this is very easy to do with Ansible. So we'll start with covering the configuration options, which are necessary for a production server. Under the UISKI configuration, the most important option for you is changing HTTP to socket. The HTTP protocol is less efficient than the UISKI protocol. UISKI can talk this more efficiently to Nginx, and Nginx can handle a lot of the work for you. Uh, processes and thread are additionally important options. The defaults are usually OK, 
that you may wish to tune these in your server for performance. Securing your object IDs is an extremely important option. So Galaxy has internally given IDs to all of your different data sets, your objects, every history has its own numeric ID starting from one. But these are pretty easily guessable. So what, I, what Galaxy does is it uses the ID secret to generate a reversible hash for every data set. Every data set's sort of encrypted and then decrypted back on the back end for all of these IDs. And this is done with the ID secret variable. This needs to be set to a very good, long, random secret. And if you have to change this at any point, because it's leaked, because it's exposed, then all of the URLs that have been generated for your histories and workflows and whatnot will be invalidated, unfortunately. There is additionally a, a variable called new user dataset access role default private. This is a very long option. It sets the default permissions on a user's data set to private. In the past, Galaxy has relied on the secrecy of the random looking URLs for each data set to give privacy to each of the data sets. But setting this means that even if you can guess the IDs for data sets, you still can't access them. So if you're running a production Galaxy server, it's a very good idea to set this. There's some important um, brand customizations you can set. So namely the masthead brand that we've set this in the tutorial. And there are also a bunch of URLs you can set that'll help users find support. So a lot of these have default values that are decent. They point to the Galaxy project ones. But if you run your own support site, you might want to change these. You have the ability as an admin to add a notice banner. This will be a banner that appears at the top of Galaxy and says, hey, you whatever the message is, something like maybe there's downtime scheduled. So anytime you want to contribute or communicate very important messages to users, you can use the message box to do this. This cannot be dismissed. Users are forced to see this on every page of Galaxy. Updating your welcome page is a good idea. It can help communicate very important information to users. Things like group news, downtime periods, new tools that might be interesting to your users. All of this can be communicated through the welcome page, which people see when they visit Galaxy. This is just part of running a production server, right? That you communicate well with your users. You tell them what's going on, what changes are coming, if there's anything they need to be aware of, all of that sort of thing. For production usage, also you might want to start worrying about the security of your data sets and the outputs from tools. There are a couple of tools in Galaxy that are well used that produce HTML or SVG outputs. These can, in theory, contain attacks against other users. If you share an HTML page with another user from Galaxy, there's the potential that a malicious JavaScript could be included. The tools that are in the public repositories usually are quite good. You should review them for yourself, though, to make sure that this isn't impossible. And then additionally, on top of that, Galaxy by default sanitizes all of the HTML outputs to prevent this sort of class of attack. Um, and when you try and view these in the browser, they'll look a bit strange because they have been rendered properly intentionally. You can choose a whitelist of tools, though, that say, OK, these tools, we know they produce good, valid, secure output, and we aren't worried about them. There's additionally the sort of XSS vulnerable mind types. This is just for SGBG file types. And if you have tools that produce SVGs, you might want to set this just so your users can actually view the outputs. There's some debugging options, which if you're running production server, you'll never need because the debugging options should not be enabled in production usually. Um, if you're running a test galaxy, you can enable them there, of course, to test things out and see, try and debug issues. Configuring FTP. So when you're running a production server, a lot of users will say, oh, I want to upload my data sets. And while Galaxy can natively handle a lot of these data set uploads, having an FTP server can be a matter of convenience for them. You can say, oh, start your FTP upload and let it run overnight or something. And you can close your browser and not worry about interrupting the upload. Um, things like this. Users can upload to FTP. And there are a couple of tools. They'll let users export data back to FTP in order to download. So this can just be a nice user convenience. Uh, data libraries. We'll have a special tutorial on this, but library management is a common problem for production servers. How do I manage who has access to which libraries, who can import data to the server, that sort of thing. And by setting all of these options, you can control who has access to do that. 
and where they can import data from. SMTP is an important part of running production server. Emails can be sent to validate user email addresses, which is important if you want to be able to actually communicate with your users again after they've registered. Galaxy can talk to an SMTP server and any error emails can be sent, including to those users, as well as to your group mailing list, things like this. There are a lot more options though that you can set in the full galaxy.yaml file. If you're running a production server, we strongly, strongly encourage you to look through all of these options, see if any of them are relevant for you, and then set them. Thank you. So running Galaxy through USKey was good. It's a very easy first step to just say, hey, does this work? Is everything turning on like we expect? But a more performant option is to run it through Nginx. USKey natively can speak HTTP protocol, but it speaks it a little bit inefficiently. As a result, we can switch to Nginx and switch to the USKey protocol itself. It has its own protocol named after itself, which is very confusing. Um, and this is a lot more performant. Nginx can give us a lot of benefits, like if you want to have upstream authentication, like um, LDAP authentication through Nginx, this is an option, or OpenID, things like this. Galaxy supports all of these things itself, but if you have an existing CAS system at your university or so, then Nginx can be good. It's also really good for serving static files. Galaxy has a lot of static files within itself. It has both the user data, the data sets that are created by users, as well as all of the CSS and JavaScript and images. All of that code can just be proxied by Nginx. Nginx can read it directly from disk, can skip the step of talking to USKey. It's a lot more efficient. And then USKey can save all of its processing time for tasks that are actually interesting, like processing jobs, rendering pages, et cetera. We really, really strongly recommend that you use Nginx or Apache, either are fine. We use Nginx with all of these galaxy.star deployments, so we can recommend that. We also know a lot of users who already have an Apache server and just use that. So I'm putting the Nginx role at the very bottom. And then we need to make this important change. If you don't make this change, bad things happen. So we're going to edit our group bars slash galaxy servers. And then up here under the whiskey section, we're going to change it from so HTTP to socket. And what this does is it changes um, from USG will no longer talk HTTP protocol. Instead, it will talk USG protocol. And Nginx is able to talk that as, talk that protocol as well. Additionally, we're switching it to listen only on 127.0.0.1. This means that no requests from outside of your server will be able to talk to Galaxy. This starts to be part of our defense in depth. We have our Galaxy server, but we don't want it to talk to anyone other than the Nginx server. And so Nginx will talk to it on this port on the same host, so everything will work well but it prevents people from outside the server accessing. Next, we're going to add a whole lot bunch of variables for certbot. We're going to go all the way down to the bottom and add our certbot variables. Remember to remove the pluses if you're copying and pasting from the training materials. So again, certbot is what controls the SSL certificates. We set it to automatically renew at some random hour some random minute of every day, it'll check if it needs to be renewed. It will be authenticating through the web group method. There are a couple of different ways that CertBot can authenticate to itself to talk to the Let's Encrypt servers and say, hey, I'm really gat minus whatever dot training dot galaxy project dot EU. One of these is the web root method. And with the web root method, CertBot writes out a secret file to this web root, this well-known directory. And then it informs the Let's Encrypt servers, hey, come check for this file at this domain name and this path. And if they can access that and do some cryptography, then they validate you and say, OK, I, I trust that you have control over this domain name. 
we're going to share key, share the key that is created with some users. This is something we added to the role because we often run this role and we say, okay, this user needs access, this user needs access, this user needs access. And so we grant permissions to individual users to access copies of the key. Whenever the keys, the SSL keys are successfully renewed, CertBot can execute some steps for us. We have it restart any service that needs these SSL keys. In this case, restart Nginx. And CertBot domains, this is a very, very important one. Here we set CertBot domains to be the actual domain name of our server. And we told you earlier that you need, need, need to set the real host name in the host file. And this is why, because we use this variable inventory host name that Ansible calculates when it's running from the host file. And so it knows what the server is supposed to be called and it will template this out appropriately. And lastly, we agree to their terms of service. You should read those for yourself to be sure you do too. Once we've configured CertBot, we will configure Nginx as well. So Nginx, there is this option for SE Linux users, which is only CentOS and RHEL, not Ubuntu or Debian. It'll have a couple of servers and an SSL servers. These are groups of Nginx configuration that does or doesn't have SSL. And so we'll have a server set up that redirects always to SSL. And then under SSL servers, we'll have our Galaxy server configuration. This will be the actual Nginx configuration that knows how to talk to USB. We also have enable default server. There is a built-in configuration file that comes with Nginx, and we don't want that. We want to have full control over what we're doing. We set some Nginx configuration options like max body size, which controls how big files can be up, files can be that are uploaded to Nginx. This is performance protection. We define an SSL role. So the Nginx role that we're using from the Galaxy Project team knows how to use some different SSL roles to configure the SSL server or certificates. And lastly, we'll specify the certificate and private key that'll be accessed. And with that, we've configured almost all of how Nginx works. If you're running this tutorial without SSL, if you don't have a host name, a proper host name, you can read this section in order to make the necessary changes. So we're going to keep copying. This time, we're going to create some templates for what the actual Nginx configuration should look like. So we need to create this directory, templates Nginx. And then we're going to edit templates nginx redirect ssl.j2. And I'm going to paste in this content. So what this does is it defines a server that listens on port 80. It has this host name, so it'll only respond to requests coming in to GAT0 or whatever. It has a location well known. So this is what talks with the or works with the CertBot role in order to um, handle the authentication to the Let's Encrypt servers. But any requests coming in for any other path should automatically be redirected to the HTTPS version of this. So that's our redirection. Next, we will edit the Galaxy version. And what this will do is handle how Nginx actually talks to Galaxy. We'll go through this as well. So instead of listing on 80, it listens on port 443 and uses SSL. It has, again, the same server name that it's pulling from the host file. So it really, really has to be correct. We define where our log files will go. And then here is the most important location block. So this location says basically everything should be redirected through the Whiskey Pass protocol. So Whiskey protocol, Whiskey Pass passes it on to this address. This address needs to be the same as what Whiskey is configured to listen on. So remember, we set earlier our group bars Galaxy servers, and we set up here in the Whiskey socket one two seven. 
So eWhiskey is configured to listen on 127.80.80, and we need to pass it to 127.80.80. We'll pass some additional default parameters and we'll also pass the scheme. The scheme is HTTP or HTTPS. The static files are served by Nginx, which is a whole lot more efficient than having USGI do it, having it waste its time, computation time, serving files. Nginx can directly read these from the static folder and just respond instantly. Nginx also has its own caching. It'll keep items in memory or on disk if it needs to calculate them. We're going to point our welcome.html to the right place. And there's some advanced configuration that's just necessary for visualizations to work correctly. OK. That's looking pretty good. And again, there's more notes if you're running this without a proper host name. But if you're in the GAT, you should be doing this. You don't need that. You're, you have SSL, you have a proper host name. So with that, we're ready to run the playbook. So what changes did we make? We made a change to the Galaxy configuration, how USG is listening. So we should see a changed task whenever that's being processed. Right there, create Galaxy configuration file changed. So that looks good. And that is something that will tell the handler at the end that it needs to be invoked and the Galaxy needs to be restarted. Nothing else is changing, which is as we expect. OK, now we're getting into the Nginx role. So the Nginx role will install the Nginx package we use a specific version of the Nginx package that has a lot of stuff compiled into it. It'll set up the configuration. And the Nginx role works a little bit differently than other roles simply because of the dance it has to do to get an SSL certificate. It's a complicated thing, but again, you don't have to worry about that because it's all handled for you. OK, there was a nice message up there saying, we were approved, we got a certificate, everything looks good. Some more tasks are being changed. and. We can see all of our handlers running. Some of the handlers ran halfway through, and then the rest of the handlers ran at the end. Again, that's just a specific thing about the Nginx role and how it works with Certbon, but something that's not important for you to understand. So if we run systemctl status um, Nginx, we should see that Nginx is running. If we run it with Galaxy, we should see that Galaxy is running. Everything looks good. And now, um, we should be able to access our server. And this time, we're going to remove port 8080. We're just going to access just the host name. And you'll note that we got redirected to HTTPS. But now we've got this big potential security risk ahead warning. And we need to explain a little bit about why we're getting that. So in this training, we do not request production SSL certificates from Let's Encrypt. They have two categories of SSL certificates. They have a staging certificate and a production certificate. The production certificate gives you a little green check mark. Everything's good. The staging certificate is considered invalid by every browser, but that's fine. There are rate limits on the production certificates. And we cannot request too many of those at once from a specific domain. You can't have too many failures, all of these different requirements. And if you're just one person working on one domain, it's fine. It's not an issue. But if you're setting up a training like this, then the 100 people who are in this training over the course of a week will hit those rate limits very quickly. And it will stop working. So what we do is we request the staging certificate for everyone. And you get this big warning message. What you can do is you can click on Advanced and accept the risk and continue. You can view the certificate if you like. You'll see that it says Fake LE Intermediate. This is a fake Let's Encrypt Intermediate Certificate. But that's exactly what we expect. So we know that's good. Accept the risk and continue. And you'll get to your Galaxy. And now this is being served by Nginx. And everything looks pretty and perfect. 
if you noticed earlier that this wasn't quite formatted correctly, you basically didn't have all the static maps it needed, but Nginx knows how to proxy everything perfectly. So that looks great. Congratulations to everyone who made it this far on getting your Galaxy running. There is a note here on role dependencies I'd like to talk about quickly. So we've mostly been adding these roles at the end every time, but there's actually a lot of complex interdependencies between these roles. They're not so bad now, but they get a lot worse as we go on during the week. So the PostgreSQL role doesn't have any requirements. The PostgreSQL object role also doesn't depend on like any variables being set or anything. It just depends on this role being done and completed. Pip, no dependencies. Galaxy, no dependencies. The Miniconda role depends on variables set by Galaxy. So Miniconda role strictly has to come after the Galaxy role. Same for the systemd role and same for Nginx. All of these point to the Galaxy to variables set by the Galaxy role. We can see that in the templates Nginx Galaxy we set up. These Galaxy server directory are all set by the Galaxy role. So the Galaxy role needs to run first. And with that, we're ready to log into Galaxy. And if you use an email that is one of the admin user emails that we set earlier, then we'll be an admin user. So I'm going to check which emails we set. And here we set admin at example.org. So I'm going to create an account, log in or register back in our Galaxy with one of these administrator emails. And with that, create. And there we're logged in as a Galaxy admin. You can see that we have this admin menu that appears. And if you've made it this far, fantastic. Pat yourself on the back. You've. This has been the hard part. Everything gets easier after that. You've got a Galaxy that's working. You know it works. You know the playbooks work. And now you can just add stuff on top of that to make your Galaxy more exciting, more fun. OK, let's get one of these more fun things set up too, the job configuration. So by default, Galaxy runs. It handles all of its own jobs. We'll discuss the job configuration in detail on Wednesday when we go through the connecting Galaxy to a job cluster or direct, uh, distributed resource manager. But for now, we're just going to set up a very basic job configuration file. This will just tell Galaxy here explicitly is how we want things to be run. There are a couple of basic sections plugins, destinations, and tools. Plugins tell Galaxy, here are the different types of resource managers we want to talk to, the different type of job systems. Destinations lists all of the different configurations we want to send Galaxy jobs to, such as maybe I have a big memory configuration for some of my high memory tools, or I have a five CPU destination for some tools that need five CPUs, cores, that sort of thing. And then lastly is the tools section. This says, okay, this tool should go to this destination, a very static mapping. We'll cover that again a bit more on Wednesday. So here's what the basic job configuration file looks like. We've got a plugins section and inside this plugin section is this local job runner section. This local job runner plugin, it's just Galaxy running the jobs itself. It'll start the bash, it'll start the command on the shell. It will wait for it to finish, et cetera. This is very inefficient, not great, et cetera. The worst part about the local runner is when you restart Galaxy, it'll kill all of the jobs. So if you're setting up a local Galaxy, this works to test, but we'll get to Wednesday on how you should do this properly. We also set workers equals four. This is just four threads that are responsible for working on jobs. We have a destination. The ID is local and the runner is local. So that runner points over to this plugin. So anything sent to destination local gets run by the local plugin. So we're going to set up our templates galaxy config directory. And inside templates, we have the Nginx and galaxy directories now. And inside galaxy, we'll just have the config directory. 
And in there, we're going to set up all of the job configuration. So we're going to create this file, templates galaxy config job conf. Templates galaxy config job conf. And inside this job configuration file, we're just going to set up this really basic galaxy configuration for jobs. Very simple, doesn't do anything exciting, but it's just a good thing to do explicitly. And now we need to tell Galaxy, hey, we've added this job configuration file. This, you, you will find it inside the configuration directory, and it should be called jobconf.xml. So I'm going to open up brute bars Galaxy servers. So this is a diff for those of you who aren't familiar with that, by the way. It just says that in the old, this was the old version of this file. This is the new version of this file. And around this area, something was changed. And you can see a little bit of context before and after the changed lines. This just gives you an idea of where this change belongs in the whole configuration file, because the whole configuration file is quite big, right? We've already added um, 96 lines of configuration, which is a lot. And so this job config file needs to go just above the whiskey at the same level as all of this file path and check migrate tools. So we'll see right there is where this line belongs. And below that, we also need to configure Galaxy config templates. So within the Ansible Galaxy role, Sometimes you need to send files just somewhere on the Galaxy server. You want to say, I want this template file or this static file to end up somewhere inside Galaxy. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say this template source, templates Galaxy config job, job conf, should end up this destination. But this destination doesn't look like a normal destination, right? We've written galaxy config.galaxy.jobconfig file. So what's going on there is that when this variable here is being read, it looks in galaxy config, galaxy, job config file, and says, oh, you want it in the configuration directory slash job conf. So what happens there is that galaxy says, or the Ansible galaxy role says, okay, I want to template this out to this location. And by defining this location as exactly what we tell Galaxy, exactly where we tell Galaxy the job configuration files should be found, we're certain that those are in sync, right? We know that that job conf template, template that we are describing, will go exactly where Galaxy is going to look for it afterwards. So that's a, a nice thing that we can do in Ansible, is refer to other parts of the configuration to make sure that all of the configuration stays in sync that there's only one variable that controls where that file belongs and that anytime we need to know where that file belongs, we just look it up in the variable. And with that, we can run the playbook. There, um, the configuration file has changed again. That's the job configuration variable that we've set being passed along. And when it's done, we should be able to check out our configuration file. So again, this won't change how your Galaxy works. This is the basic default configuration. We're just setting this explicitly because it makes life a little bit nicer. Okay, Galaxy's restarted up there. And everything's done. 101 were OK. Three things were changed. 58 things were skipped. That looks good. And as we said, we can check out our job configuration file and see it looks approximately like our templates. And again, this is super boring right now, right? Like we've just set the config file, and oh, look, it's exactly what we told it to be. This will get more interesting on other days of the workshop where we start templating things out in the job configuration file, or we set up advanced things in the job configuration file. So 
what would happen if disaster were to strike? Well, if disaster strikes, absolutely nothing happens. You're perfectly safe. So for this disaster, we can pretend that your database is on another machine. You don't need to follow along with this unless you just feel like it. I'm going to do it just to show you how easy it is to recover from everything going wrong. Um, usually when we give this workshop in person, one of us will wipe the galaxy directories of everyone in the workshop and they'll go, oh no, what happened? You know, my galaxy disappeared. And we'll say, yeah, well, you know, disaster happened, a uh, meteor hit your server room, something like that. And because you did everything right, because you used Ansible, because you followed all the best practices, because you've written down everything in this configuration. So in your directory, um, all of this configuration is backed up somewhere and safe. You have your user data backed up and your database backed up. We're making some assumptions here. Let's say your Galaxy server disappears. Well, you're going to be absolutely fine. So carefully, I'm going to remove <laughs> my entire Galaxy server. There's stuff in there now. And I'm just going to wipe out all of it. And again, we're assuming that the user data is backed up and that the, um, the database is backed up or somewhere else on a different server, something like this. So, oh no, disaster, disaster is striking. And Ansible saves you from all of the bad things that can happen. Because we did everything in Ansible, we know we're gonna be fine. We can try accessing our galaxy and nothing, it's broken. Oh no, how horrible. And here's going to be the very labor intensive process to revert the apocalypse. We're going to run the playbook. And then we're going to get, get, go get a cup of coffee, coffee, while it runs. We're going to pat ourselves on the back for saving the day because we did everything in Ansible and everything can just reset. Life is easy. All of this is running again. All of the changes are re-being made. It's like, oh, we need to update the directories. We need to recreate this jobs directory and recreate the configuration file. And Ansible's doing all of that for us. So Galaxy will come back up. Everything will be fine. As long as you back up the parts that need to be backed up, like the user data and the database, and you have your Ansible playbook somewhere safe and hopefully backed up as well. And we have a lot of experience in this. We've, the Galaxy administration teachers, we've managed a lot of hardware over our lives. We know that things happen, bad things happen, weird things happen, hardware dies for no reason. But because we've written everything down, we know that we can just run our playbook and everything is gonna come back and we don't have to worry about it. We really, we recommend strongly that you put everything possible in Ansible, just so you have this one button you can press. You just press playbook galaxy.xml or YAML and everything gets recreated and life is so good. We've used this a lot, um, Galaxy Europe especially. We have a lot of our infrastructure as virtual machines and anytime something goes wrong with the virtual machine, we just press delete. And then we run the playbook and the virtual machine gets recreated with everything. So back up your playbooks, back up everything that needs to be backed up. And when something does happen, something completely unexpected, you'll be fine. So while that's running, I'm going to run through the rest of the tutorial. Production and maintenance is an important section. So the Lots of people have questions over, okay, how much time do I need to spend maintaining Galaxy? With Ansible, with a smallish server, say under 25 users, it can be a day or two per month of maintenance just to update new tools, install new tools, um, update Galaxy whenever a release is made. You may want to take some time to do that. Compare that with large public servers like usegalaxy.org, EU, and org AU. All of these are full-time jobs for one to two people. Your admins do find time to do other things, but it's a very intensive job. 
So keeping Galaxy updated, one of the important things here is setting the Galaxy commit ID to a release branch. So we set ours to 20.09. And as a result, if there are any bug fixes made to the 20.09 branch or any hot patches that we need from the Galaxy team, we'll get them for free. Whenever we run the playbook again, it'll update to the latest version of the branch and we'll be good to go. This is another moment when if you run the playbook regularly, it's a good thing because then you can be sure that your Galaxy is updated, everything's good. One thing this won't do, however, is update you from one release to the next. That is something you'll have to do manually, which is a very difficult process <laughs> or not. All you have to do is change the commit ID. It's a good idea to check all of the release notes Check out the latest galaxy.yaml that sample file to see if there are any fun new configuration options that you might want to use. Compare the other configuration files to see if anything's changed that you need to change. Say you've hard coded some data types, you may want to check that there are no new data types, that sort of thing. You may want to check that there are no new um, configuration options that you might want to enable just because you're waiting for them or you're excited about the possible feature. But this is the bulk of what you have to do. This is something. Um, when we switched to this at usegalaxy.eu, it saved me literally two days worth of effort. It went from a two day process to make sure everything was updated on the server, carefully modify things by hand to, oh yeah, I'll change the release variable and I'll maybe dip some files to make sure everything looks good, make sure that we aren't missing any new configuration options, but it makes life so easy. Use Ansible. Um, user support is a question we often get. Um, how can we help you help your users? And there are lots of resources for this. Help.galaxyproject.org is the primary landing point for user help. So if you have users and they need help with biological tasks or biochemical tasks or bioinformatics, send them to help.galaxyproject.org. There's a very large user community. They'll probably find help there. And if not, they'll find direction to somewhere where they can get help. User impersonation is a nice variable to set if you're the Galaxy admin. This enables all of Galaxy admins to impersonate individual users. So when a user comes to you and says, hey, my job isn't working, if your users are like my users, they send you a screenshot of a red item in their history. And it's like, OK, that's not super helpful. But with allow user impersonation, you can impersonate them. You can be their account and then go view the error report yourself to figure out what went wrong. It makes life a lot easier. Ah, yes, the note on running on a cluster. So this comes back on Wednesday as well. If you're running Galaxy and you have a cluster, you have a network of computers that you're using to run jobs and to hold the user data, all of these different things. Some bits of Galaxy need to be accessible on that cluster because when a tool runs or a job runs, it may need to look at Galaxy's dependencies or configuration, things like, or our server code from Galaxy itself for things like the upload jobs. When those run on a cluster, they need code from the Galaxy code base. So these are all of the directories that should need to be exported and need to be the same between Galaxy itself and the cluster. Some of these have to be the same directory, namely the data directory, the user data directory. That needs to be precisely the same thing. However, some of them also can run off of two different copies if that makes life easier. If you want to have the server directory, you can just reclone Galaxy on your cluster if that's a bit faster for you. So most of you will be using something like NFS and you'll need to have stuff exported over NFS to both your Galaxy server and to your data server or your compute cluster. Um, other software, lots of people ask about deploying other software within Galaxy or within the Ansible role. And this is definitely possible. If 
sometimes you can write your own Ansible role to deploy that software, just to make sure everything stays in one place and you have this nice playbook that does everything to get your entire server set up. Um, you don't have to do everything in Ansible though. You can treat it piecewise. You can take just one part of your infrastructure, in this case, Galaxy, and switch this over to Ansible. You don't have to switch everything at once. And with that, let's check back to see if everything works exactly. Okay. Oh, look at that through a little bit of movie magic. The server is completely done running Ansible again. Which took some minutes. We can refresh. And our galaxy is back. You've saved the day by using Ansible. Um, thanks for following this tutorial. Let us know if you have any questions. More importantly, please give us feedback on this content. Tell us how it went, what you felt about it. If there was anything too difficult or any questions you had that weren't answered in the tutorial, let us know. Um, deployment with Ansible is really easy. Complexity can grow. There are a lot of examples of public playbooks. You don't have to start with that. You can start with something really simple like this and it should be really easy. Um, congratulations and thank you.